here's your sheet. Uh, all right, everyone. Uh, we're, we're honored to have with us today uh, Professor Dinesh Manocha from the University of North Carolina. Uh, professor Dinesh Manocha is the uh, Mason Distinguished Professor. Um, he has uh, been awarded the prestigious Sloan Fellowship, uh, NSF Career Award, the ONR Young Investigators Award, and a whole mess of best paper awards in many various conferences, um, spanning robotics, graphics, and other things. Um, he's done some high impact work in collision detection, geometry computation, and uh, he's going to tell us some of the recent interesting innovations that he's been working on recently. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Yasser, and good afternoon. Can you hear me at the back? Uh, it's a real honor to be here. You know, uh, I have a lot of great friends and, um, and, and a lot of people I've looked up to their work o over the decades. So it's really an honor to be here, and thank you for inviting me. So I'll talk about uh, some of the work we've been doing at uh, North Carolina over the last six years on modeling lots of agents and lots of crowds. I think uh, whenever I put the word crowd, it's very interesting because we all have a meaning of what crowd is, and we all have an interpretation of what crowd is. And if you come to the talk that I'm going to solve your version of the crowd problem, I think you're going to be disappointed. It's a very challenging and kind of undefined problem, but I'll tell you what we can do and what challenges there are. I always say uh, most of my work is uh, I've been very fortunate to have a lot of collaborators, students. So if you hear any good ideas in my talk, uh, you should uh, contribute to my students. Um, Many of them are there. And one of my actual research also is with people in uh, Hajj Research Institute in Mecca. I'll show you some results from uh, a very challenging crowd problem where they need a lot of crowd modeling to make things much better. So let me start with the one part of my talk. It's a multi-agent system. And I know if any of you are from AI background, uh, the term agent is very overloaded. So uh, in my context, uh, think of agents as humans like us. We are supposed to be intelligent, right? Uh, more intelligent than animals, supposedly. So we're independent agents in some shared environment, shared physical environment. And the way we characterize our agents are, we all basically self-actuated. You know, we can think. We believe we have independent goals. You know, maybe after this talk is over, some of you will go to the restaurant, some will go to your office, some will go to your car parking lot. Each of you have a goal. And you may have a similar goal, but each of you have an independent goal. Uh, and typically, as humans do, we are sensing the environment you know, with our vision, ears, and other sensing. And as we sense the environment, we walk around without bumping into obstacles other people. And at the same time, we're observing everybody else. If I'm crossing the street, I'm looking at a moving car. I want to avoid that. If I'm going to the corridor, I don't want to bump into you till you're playing basketball. Then, then it's a different ball game. And the environment is the physical environment where obstacles are there. So this is kind of a notion of an agent in a, in a physical setting. And think about humans, you know, as you typically walk around every day. So why do we care about it? So there are clearly crowds, you see, all over the uh, humans. But there's no risk to humans. A lot of folks in uh, different fields have been studying ants, you know? And probably, you know, I don't know all about the anatomy of ants, but the ants will satisfy all the assumptions I'm making there, too. And if ants are not enough, you know, you've all seen big flock of birds. So these are all different kinds of systems of multi-agent system we observe in nature. And ideally, we want a technique to simulate all of them. Now, this is a pretty challenging problem in lots of multiple domains. Uh, for our work and our talk, I will listen to the part, what we call the motion planning. Uh, motion planning is a term that comes from, traditionally from robotics. And I know a lot of people at CME done great work in that, too. But the idea is figuring out how to get where you want to go. So I just came from Smith Hall. You know, Go out, take the stairs up, take the elevator, take good, go left, go right. That's the way you do it. So if you ever time look at like a bird's eye view of a camera, and I'm sure you got a great amount of cameras, including your, you know, the great basketball dome Yasser was showing me here. If you take a bird's eye view of any setting, like this is an airport or a mall, Everybody has potentially some goals. Some people are standing and chatting, but the rest of them are moving. What's going on there? Now, why is this motion planning, which we humans do obviously, trivially, becomes challenging in a simulation world? So for one of these agents, everybody around him or her is an obstacle that he or she wants to avoid. That's the first challenge we've got to deal with. And they're dynamic. As I'm moving, you're moving. I'm reacting to you. You're reacting to me. And 
to the n times. The n people all reacting to each other, plus the dynamic obstacles in the scene. As I said, they're reactive. So this reactive part is a very important component. I'll show you how hard it is to model the reactive part and what difference does it make. And of course, the landscape is complex. And in some way, you can think about when all of us humans are moving, either implicitly or explicitly, we are all solving a distributed motion planning problem. When the talk is over, hopefully you sit at the end of the talk, you all leave this room, you all are doing some distributed motion planning problem, not bumping into the obstacles, not bumping into each other. That's what we do all the time. So we want to simulate that. And why do we care about that? So first notion is crowd. And the first place you see crowd is, of course, games and, and movies. You see a lot of special effects. They want to do crowds. But that's not the only part to it. Uh, I'm sure I'm a place like Robotic Institute. I'm honored to be here. There are a lot of work on multiple robots. You know, We can't build one smart robot. Let's bring teams of robots working together. And these teams of robots can do some tasks together. That is also a very similar kind of multi-robot problem. It's the dynamics of robots are different than how humans work around. Um, this is an example, other example of you know, how robots come together. Swarms. And I've heard this term, swarms, a couple of times. I was building Harvey Chaucer's lab doing that work. And believe it or not, there are a lot of people making money. About just uh, a while ago, Amazon.com bought this company called Kiva, paying about $775 million in cash for dealing with their warehouses, where they have these uh, robots, which basically move along rectilinear thing, and they move stuff around, the big warehouses. They want to automate the whole shipping and data, all the collection stuff. So these are all examples of similar motion planning problems. Another one is traffic. So even if when you're driving on the road, with your hands on the steering and all the other you know, brakes you're controlling with, you're again doing some kind of a collision avoidance and going towards your goal, either guided by GPS or whatever other sensing device you have. These are all examples of similar distributed motion problem. UAVs, we all hear about a lot of drones nowadays. It's a very common thing. For the most of my talk, I'll focus on crowd simulation. Towards the end, I will show you some results we have on robot motion planning. But if you're more interested in that, we can talk about it. So let's look at crowds. Who cares about crowds? And crowd, as I said, is a big chunk of my talk. Clearly, special effects in the movies. There are lots of movies. You've seen a lot of crowds. You know, the folks in Veta Studio make amazing crowds. But that's not the only part I'm talking about. Uh, there's a whole field by the name called pedestrian dynamics. And a lot of the big groups in Europe, they work in planning. When you design stadiums, or even when you design airplanes, or when you design all the hotels, when you design the new buildings, you won't worry about the crowd flow. And the, if emergency evacuation happens, how soon can you evacuate it? How many exits do you have? So I'll talk more about that. Uh, people in computer vision, I've been talking to some great people at CMU, crowd and tracking exception comes up. And more and more recently, there's a lot of work you know, with robotics, driverless cars coming. There are also a lot of interest on you know, automated wheelchairs. So you've got a wheelchair with all the sensors and camera. And you're sitting in the wheelchair, but the wheelchair is moving among the crowd and doing automatic navigation. So they're all examples of human-robot interaction. And nowadays, you do see more, you'll see more and more of these kinds of automated robot, like driverless car, sitting around. So just to motivate who cares about crowd, we just had a project with Boeing. Now, uh, Boeing has been a lot in the news recently, you know, all about the 787 battery problems. But before 787 was a proof of flying, and so what triple uh, A380, they have to satisfy a test. And the test is, if an emergency occurs, can you evacuate the plane in 90 seconds? I don't know how many of you know about this test. And I hope none of you have been to emergency evacuation. But these people design a plane, which takes, we all know how challenging it is. They put, cut all the steel, do it. So this is a, a video uh, of evacuation. They got a whole bunch of subjects. Uh, can you hear me at the back? OK, wait a second. Sorry about that. Uh, just a second. My apologies. I thought I fixed it, but. Uh, if you turn up the laptop volume, Yeah, I think somewhere it went down. Sorry. We don't need to hear someone screaming. Right? Well, it's fun to hear that. Let's put it. It's much more fun to hear than to fun to hear me. Then I can motivate you why my research is important. Let's put it this way. All right. 
Back in Hamburg, the critical 90-second evacuation test is finally about to begin. Today it's a big day, yeah. It's a little bit tense. I went through my checklist 10 times. Uh, no, I did not forget something. But again, I go through the, uh, through the checklist and the checklist again, 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 again. And that's it. While Smile knows exactly what is supposed to happen in the next few minutes, the passengers don't seem to have the slightest clue. We're going to the machine, and I think we get a command, and then we get out. Lane is dark, uh, then... So, I will not bore you with the whole thing, but this is, there's, you know, passengers who is come t-shirt, and eventually, they put them in the plane, and, you know, they all sit down. The entire procedure through 40 different infrared cameras. And nobody in the aircraft knows exactly 40 cameras, yes, sir. Right. Evacuation will finally go off. Right. See, there's a clock running. So luckily in this case, you know, they did satisfy the test and therefore A380 is flying, the current version of that. But the idea is, you know, how expensive these tests are. And what if you don't do it, right? Boeing has done amazing amount of CAD. They designed the whole thing with CATIA, amazing amount of simulation they do. But eventually they have to figure out whether I can do the evacuation. And of course, whenever you fly, what do they tell you, you know? Don't put your, your belt back next to you because there'll be obstacles. Make sure the near end exists to you. It's all preparation for that. So this one application about they come to us and say, would you design a crowd simulation system, evacuation system, so that we don't have to do the test, or at least your simulation can do a good enough a job, so when you do the real test, to please FAA, it will pass easily. That's a good question. That's not the only one. There are a lot of people who design stadium. I have a collaboration with a group in Germany, with Armin Seyfried's group at Supercomputing Center, Jules. This is a place where they actually get uh, 400 subjects, pay them 50 euros a day. Uh, you can do that for three days. And they are putting them in a stadium and trying to figure out how they do evacuation flow. So they put the subject, you can see they mark them with black, red, and this thing. And they really put markers to make the vision tracking problem easier and tracking them. Now I was telling them, wow, I'm, they're giving us the data. And I said, thank you. Even if it costs like 50 euros a day, 400 people, and I have a lot of grad students, I don't know about CMU, but at UNC, IRB guys will kill me. I don't think I can ever do this study. That's maybe CMU is than that. But they're actually getting people how they leave their seats. And this is a case where everybody's calm and composed. It's not like a crazy football game where everybody's drunk or something like that. And they're tracking them, and they're trying to figure out and see how the crowd comes. And at this place, the jamming occurs. We'll talk about crowd density. There's something called fundamental diagram. They all come across, but the jamming occurs. There are three flows come through on this. So these people are doing a lot of studies of flows in the labs or in the outdoor settings. And now they want to do a test of 1,000 people. They're collecting data, how human crowds really move, you know, how we track them. So we can do some simulation, we'll do that. So these are all the cases of, so they can design stadium, where to put the exits, uh, where to minimize the evacuation time. Think of a situation, what is a panic? What will happen in a panic in a stadium? Will it cause a jam? Will it cause, you know, we always hear about crowd disasters, things happen. Uh, one of the research we are focusing on is large-scale crowd. Now, large is, of course, <coughs> numbers, millions of agents. Well, you say the city of Pittsburgh maybe has a population of maybe half a million. Oh, it's a big crowd. But, you know, they're spread over the whole city. The two things in crowd we care a lot more about than this number, one is called the density. I will show you videos where the density touches close to eight or nine people per meter square. Again, this is one meter, three feet by three and a half feet. Eight people per meter square. And I'll show you that video. It happens. And there's a relationship, something called velocity. So typical human speed, I'm not assuming you're a super athlete, uh, some of you may be, is anywhere from 0.1 to 5 meters per second. I know somebody can do a sprint 100 meters in 10 seconds, so they are exceptional. I come nowhere close to that. Most, they have done some studies in the lab. Most adult males, you know, they just happen to do males, happen to walk at an average speed of 1.3 meters per second. Again, so next time when you walk out, 
You're going home. Can you guess how much speed are you walking? You know, take how many steps you're taking. But the velocity is a big range. So very dense crowd, very slow. You can say open crowd 1.3. And if you're one of those great athletic person, you will walk faster. And there's a big relationship between density and velocity. In fact, the two things that determine crowd behavior is the density and the velocity. They are the more challenging part. The agent part itself is not so big. Now, in real life, there are lots and lots of big crowd gathering. Now, what does it got to do with research? So I'll show you the, some of the work we are doing at Health Research Institute where they want to improve the architecture design to have the crowd flow. A couple of years ago, there was Shanghai Expo, and they were so worried about crowd disasters. So most of what these people do, including people at Disney theme park, they are very conservative in terms of crowds. And they will say, OK, we can't have so many people. We close the theme park. So a lot of these events, at least the ones they have control over, like the Shanghai Expo, and to some extent, the, the Mecca, and the Hajj Pilgrim in Mecca, they become very conservative, and they're worried about how crowd flow occurs. So they are coming to us, the Hajj people, hoping we have a solution. And I hope they are right that we can do help them with a better design and crowd flow evacuation. So that comes to the real part of my work, you know, what we're doing. So this is not a new area. This is studied in different fields. Uh, computer graphics, robotics, pedestrian dynamics, psychology, sociology. It's pretty well studied. Uh, the work that we have been pursuing at UNC, we call it velocity-based, and I explain that to you. And just to classify the work, the most of prior method, which I mean around since 70s or 80s, we call them non-velocity-based. I will not detail into that. But I'll focus more on the velocity plays obstacles of that. But especially in graphics, and there's a model designed by Renault way back in 1987 called Boyd's, which is also widely used outside graphics too. And what they defined was they look at human to human interaction. There are three basic rules separation, alignment, and cohesion. And based on that, they were able to look at lots of human like flocking and emerging behavior. It's a very popular model, very widely used in movies for animals. Folks in uh, animals are doing it. It's very, you can see all the big movies, some of the Lion King and all that. They use all this stuff. Now what happened this model? So this is one thing from our work different. We are also worrying about very dense crowds. Like I tell you the example of the Hajj Bell game. They got eight, meters per, eight, eight people a meter square. Things like Boyd and previous model work well if humans are well separated. Like if everybody has a good notion of personal space, there's a big distance around you, they work well. But the Boyd system, if you download their code and you just play this thing, you suddenly see they come very close. They, they can't avoid collision. And you see them on the left passing through each other. This is some of our velocities planning I'll tell you about. We can do this with no problem. So one of the biggest challenges with the previous system has been when the density becomes very high, they become very close to each other. There are lots of problems which don't work well. But our work is addressed to deal with this thing. So, the other work is in actually coming from physics, particle system, and traffic called social forces. It's another very popular model proposed by Helbing and very widely used. It's actually, he published a whole bunch of paper even in Nature. They're very well-cited papers inspired by granular materials. And the idea is every agent has a notion of some force. And you can define different kind of force terms, like repulsion force, attraction force. You think of them as particle, apply the basic second laws of motion, and you can do that. And, and this is a very popularly used model. It has a lot of benefits to that. And traditionally, in traffic, people also do what's called cellular automata. You divide the space into grids and assign each space to one agent, and they can go between the grids. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time discussing the models, but one of the motivations that we face why we didn't do this is because this is an example of the crowd I showed you at Hajj. There's a holy Kaaba. And during the, especially in the Hajj, they have to take seven circles around it and stop and pray. This is a very dense crowd. And this is where the density becomes, as I said, close to eight people per meter square. People are empirically observed. They're taking cameras and do it. And here's our example of, we did a simulation of that. Of course, the rendering is nowhere good, but it's not about rendering. So here's our simulation of that. Now, if you try to model them by social forces, if anybody decides to implement physics, when the density becomes a high system, becomes very unstable. All the forces acting up. So you take a very small time step. And if you're doing solar automata, they will not have the continuous flow. Again, I'm showing the results of what we can do and trying to show that most previous methods could not do very dense crowds, something we need in these kinds of applications. So that comes to the, you know, the rut, what we want to do. We want a system where we have continuous motion because humans actually move continuously. And surprisingly, humans tend to move pretty smoothly. I was myself surprised. Boy, how could I be smooth? You know, I'm such a big, fat guy. But it happens to be the case. Dense scenarios, realistic path, 
So all the way from you know, uh, like a pedestrian setting to a religious gathering to games, of course, gamers want everything in real time. They all want some kind of a crowd. So we are looking at solutions which can solve all the scenarios. So that comes back to what we are doing. Our work started from what we call velocity base. It's a notion of velocity based consideration. And I'll just, what I will talk about is some of the papers we published over the last five years. We introduced a notion of reciprocity velocity obstacles. I'll tell you a little bit more about it. Bring about techniques for geometric optimization. Basically, we care about speed and solving a motion planning problem in a distributed manner. We're doing geometric optimization quite well. Then, to generate a realistic path, we get some ideas from biomechanics. Uh, PLE stands for a principle called least effort principle, showing humans are lazy, we borrow that. Then, all humans are different. You know, some of them are more aggressive, some of them are shy. We take ideas from psychology literature and do personality models. And one thing about crowd also is that we all react to environment. Let's say a panic comes in or react to each other. And again, we borrow some ideas from cognitive modeling and try to do that. So in the next 15, 25 minutes, 20 minutes, I'm going to show you how all this comes together. So let me just give you a very basic overview. Think of, you know, we model every agent as a circle in 2D. It's a very, very, I would say, simple and stupid model, but let's look at it. And if you're given a position of the space, we take the velocity vector. If you're walking along this direction, x, y, in a positive y direction, you say this is the velocity. It's very simple to see that. And if it's walking like this, you say some velocity vectors here. It's a pretty, pretty simple mapping you can do. Now you ask the question, here's a blue agent and there's an orange obstacle. How can I walk and make sure I don't bump into the orange obstacle? Oh, come on, this is high school math. You draw this projection of velocity space like this, and you can do a mathematical formulation. You took the circle around the big circle, do the projection, and you say, okay, as long as my velocity vector, the vector is not in this direction, or my velocity is not in this direction, I won't collide. This is an idea which has come to be known as velocity obstacle recently. And we actually got this term from robotics in the mid 90s. And actually it turns out, so this is the velocity obstacle, you transform it here. It tells you what velocity can lead to collision, what will not, the dual is not collision. Now, there, is this idea really new? And actually we did some literature search. No, it actually dates back to at least 1902, 111 years ago. Folks in uh, ship navigation used to design something called a course integrator. And if you want to see a version of that, uh, go to Smithsonian. So this is a notion of two ships are going and how they use the ship to track the thing and they look at the velocity. So how the two ships, about 110 years ago, made sure they don't bump into each other. They were doing this. And similarly, in people in uh, you know, missile guidance have done that, a maneuvering board. As I said, uh, we got the term from this paper by Fironian Schiller, mid-90 in robotic literature, so we just start calling velocity obstacles. But the same idea seems to have been invented in different fields for more than 110 years with different names. But since we published with that literature, we'll just stick with that. That's what we do. Now, this was the notion of velocity obstacles, but how do we deal with dynamic things? Remember in crowd? I'm avoiding you, you're avoiding that person, that person avoiding you. This is a total dynamically continuous reactive cycle going on. So in this assumption velocity obstacle was, it was very good if the orange obstacle is static. Great, I do this mathematical formulation. Now what if my obstacle is moving at the same time? How do I do this? So my obstacle moves like this, I say okay, I can move a velocity obstacle like this, comes like that. This is with two agents, how do you deal with multiple agents? So this classic notion can to break down when you're given n human agents, each reacting to each other and generate smooth path. So to overcome this problem, my former postdoc, Jor Wendenberg, who is now at Utah, introduced a notion of reciprocity in velocity obstacle. That's what we call RVO. And again, I will not bore you with the math, but it's the algebra is actually pretty simple to work it out. And the idea is now you're given two agents, both in blue. <coughs> they are both walking with respect to each other in their own goals. And <coughs> His velocity obstacle like this, that person velocity obstacle like this, and you do the update like this. So this is a notion of reciprocity velocity obstacles. At every instance, as they update and move, you're computing reciprocal velocity obstacle for each agent in an independent manner. And the notion is the reciprocal velocity obstacle is giving you the set of velocities you want to avoid to not have collision. It's a sufficient condition. That's the basic notion that we use here. Let's see how this works out. So this is the original, original velocity obstacle with reacting to each other. And you see there were a lot of things. And this is our RVO. It's pretty smooth. And surprisingly, at least some of the lab experiment people have done, the lab motion is more like RVO smooth. Humans don't do this. Somehow we have this protocol 
eye contact or cultural issue, we would get this right. So once we do this, how do you do this very quickly for large number of agents? Remember, you could be given very dense crowds. And every instance of the simulation loop, you're updating your state. This is somehow you're doing this computation. So we looked into this notion of that every agent, let's say, has a goal going from the big yellow dot to the red dot. And this is the velocity you want to do. You want to go towards your goal, but you want to avoid this notion of velocity obstacles are the velocity that can lead to collision. So the idea is, let's say if I want to go there, here's my preferred velocity, I go there, but I want to avoid collision with the tables. I'll go around it. That's the basic idea in real time. It turns out these velocity obstacles are convex shapes. We exploit the fact, even though the collision happens, and by some optimization, you can actually do some reduce to linear programming and quadratic programming problem, and you can show the optimal velocity that avoids that collision you can reduce to some kind of linear programming. Uh, again, I would not bore you with the details of that. You can read the poor papers about that. And we all know that the extremum of a linear programming problem always occurs at the intersection of convex sets, something which is well known in linear programming. We exploit that fact to really compute the velocity. So really what is going on here is that at every instance, every agent is looking at itself, its neighbors, and doing this kind of computation. So I'll show this example out here. In this case, every circle is an agent. Focus on this red agent. His or her goal is that black spot on my right, your left. So we take this stuff, but the goal is the red thing will want to go towards the goal. But at the same time, all these other agents are moving, and the red agent has no clue how they are all moving. It's just sensing them in real time and, avoid, and avoids collision. So we, what we do is ORCA is our version of a reciprocal velocity obstacle. Based on the velocity obstacle, we form this constraint. So all these lines correspond to constraint the velocity space. And if the red circle lies outside the velocity, red circle will not collide with them. And this similarly, we do permitted velocity, we do that. So let's see the simulation. Desired velocity goes here. We'll do it. So what happens is, if there were no obstacles, this agent could have walked in straight line towards the black dot. But because the obstacles in the way, it takes a new velocity, which is closest to this, but avoids collision. So you can't take the detour like that and do it. So I'll play an animation now. And the animation, you'll see how this comes around. So this is an example of, oh, sorry. Uh, so right now, you know, there's no agent nearby it. It's just going towards its goal. It's shown like a brown dot there, a straight line. In the black line, you see that there. What happens? As you come closer, other agents come close to it. It just sends them on the fly. And now it cannot follow the white line anymore. It takes the black line, deviates, and sort of goes around it. Just like this agent is avoiding all the other agents, every one of these agents is running this distributed in a distributed manner. They're all avoiding each other. So this way, everybody computes a smooth path, and you do it. So this is our basic collision avoidance scheme, which can give pretty smooth paths. And every one of them is solving linear programming, which takes a few microseconds. So we could really put together a very simple system like this, or something like an exhibition hall. Each of them is an agent. And each of them is doing computation in a real time, in a distributed manner. And there's a congestion occurs, no problem. They can all avoid collisions and go through it. Similar to what we hope humans will do. Now, what humans do is probably much more complex. But this was our first system where we could do a collision-free multi-agent navigation in a real-time manner and still hoping that, of course, that our motion is relatively smooth. It's not very jig-jag, and we can give some guarantees on that. In this Eclipse simulation, we could do this in real time, but the rendering part was the bottleneck. So the simulation part is really fast. And you can see very dense scenario that I was worried about before. We can easily handle them. Now, that's so much about this thing. Uh, they also, we work with Intel. This is very parallel friendly. You can do SIMD hardware, or you can do multiple cores. So it really parallelizes very well with all GPU, CPU parallelism. Intel has a version of that. NVIDIA has a version of that. And AT has a version of that, because a lot of gamers are using this stuff. So all the three hardware vendors put it really paralyzed on the thing. And you can do this quite well. Now, this is all about collision avoidance. Uh, most people will say human behavior is not just about collision avoidance. Human is more than that. So the biggest challenge that in all this behavior comes out to be, how do we simulate human-like behavior? Now, that's a very tough question to ask. How do you define human-like behavior? There's no mathematical model. We all observe behavior. But how humans behave, we all know humans are kind of strange. 
and you put thousands of strange people together, it becomes more challenging. So now what we started doing is we say, OK, we are not, I call them human scientists, if the better term. Let's dig a literature, what people in social sciences have learned, or different fields have learned about human behavior, and can we borrow those ideas to improve our simulator? So about three years ago, we started looking into biomechanic literature. And there's a well-known principle in biomechanics called PLE, principle least effort by zip. And, and there's a thing, they say a lot of things we do in life, even how we browse web pages, a lot of actions we do are driven by the fact fundamentally we are lazy. The, the people have studied that. So a lot of the way we move in the real world is also driven by laziness. And they're not a surprise, but how do you model laziness? Uh, in our case, we start looking into how many calories you burn. So this is not like when you go to a gym, you want to burn the maximum number of calories. This is an example of when you're typically walking, we have reason to believe that you want to minimize your calorie burn. Now, if you disagree with model, we can talk about that. But at least that's the assumption we are making. So folks have done a lot of tests in treadmills by varying the height, the elevation, the velocity, how they do it. And this is what I'm referring to the beginning of my talk. At least for the adults males, you see a function like this quadratic. So the idea is that the optimum minimum energy seems to be around, for some adult male, 1.3 meters per second. What does it mean? So what if you walk very slow? Let's say I walk very slowly at 0.5 meters per second. Of course, my each step is less energy. But then what happens is it will take me more time to get from here to there. So the amount of energy I'll burn to get from here to there will be more because I walk slowly. If some of you are very athletic and you really can run at 4 meters per second, 5 meters per second, you'll run very quickly, but you'll burn more energy. So they're saying this is the velocity where you seem to, for a given distance, you appear to burn minimum energy. This is the basic model we took. And it turns out, if you take this model equation and you turn it into we have optimization framework, it becomes elliptical like this. So we took our linear programming constraints and modified them. It becomes a little bit of a non zero optimization problem, but still we could solve it in like a quadratic pro convex programming case. It reduces to solving some kind of a fourth degree polynomial, we do it. So based on that, we say, OK, we'll find a motion for each agent in a distributed manner where that agent will burn minimum energy. So how does this works out to be the case? Uh, one example we see here to show you an example of the, how this works, this is a classic helping social force model. I talked about it before. This is our previous work where we just did optimization collision avoidance, no energy work, called the clear path. This is the work we do energy. So one case would occur is, let's say you walk down the corridor, the lobby. And you see a whole bunch of people. It's what we call congestion. Most of the time, we will avoid the congestion. We'll go around it. Because we don't want to wait and stop till the traffic to clean up. If you ever see a traffic jam, and if you have an option, you'll go around it. So with this formulation, that kind of behavior occurs automatically. Now, because we can reach the congestion, it costs more energy than going around it. Agents plan around congestion that they can see and are capable of avoiding. Again, other planning algorithms typically fail to achieve the same effect. Suppose the, the, those two goals were like going towards the goal, and they were avoiding collision. And if everyone running into each other, just stop. But we do collision avoidance, and condition avoidance does that. Let's see how this works out to be. So one of the questions we always ask is, fine, you propose this geometric optimization, you propose this biomechanical model, but really how accurate you are? And how do you measure accuracy in a field like this? There's a big push in, in general in graphics about validation. So we had a different kind of accuracy comparison. We look into visual comparison. There are a lot of phenomena we observe in real life. Can we reproduce them, macro scale patterns? There are a lot of lab settings. We're tracking vision-based path comparison and flow rates. And let me show you a whole bunch of them do it. So one of the first settings we do was, uh, I don't know how many of you know, this is the Shibuya crossing. Has anybody of you been to Shibuya? OK, you probably go to Japan a lot. I mean, a lot of collaboration. This is, I was interesting. I like going for lunch with Sid and this crossing. And one thing I like. When the red light came, I thought either he'll go like this or like this. He walked diagonally. I said, wow, I never seen a crossing like this. I was very excited. So this is one of those crossings where lights happen, and there are like five pedestrian crossings, and all of them walk at the same time. Typically in America, you know, you either walk this way or this way, and some people are cutting through. But CMU is great. You walk like this. Fantastic. You must PLE, right? You don't do. So this is a video of a Shibuya crossing. Ignore the traffic. So I'll just play this video first. So this is a live video. And now what do you see here? Think of how crowds come. 
and pay attention to the patterns. What happens is this person is following this person, this person following this person, this person following patterns. They land up forming something called lanes. It's called lane, form lane formation phenomenon. Now you're only looking at the person in front of you, but only person at the top, if you see there are a lot of lanes being forming, and therefore, you know, people are moving pretty fast at maybe 1.3 meters per second, even when the density is high. So we just set up the setting like this in our simulation and said we could do it. So on the right of the live video, ignore the traffic. On the left is our simulation. We just gave a setting like this, approximate dimension, this thing. And the, what I want you to pay attention to is the, is the crowd kind of macroscopic flow. Does it match this one? Now, I'm not doing a user study test here, but we could potentially do that too. But this was the first attempt of a real world crossing. How do traffic crossing at crowds get formed at this thing? And you do things like this. Now, was it realistic or not? That's a, that's a big question. We'll talk about that in a second. But let's look at some other things. So over the centuries, folks have observed this crowd phenomenon. You may recognize some of this term. Lane formation I just talked about, edge effects, uh, uneven density, jamming, arching. So we wanted to know, but can our model reproduce these behaviors? So we have uh, simulation experiments. This is what is called you know, the wave edge effect. Now, what this is saying is people walking at the, at the boundaries are walking faster than plotting in the middle. Have you ever observed that? Now, how many of you work in fluid simulation? If you do fluids, fluids actually the flow is, by Navier-Stokes, faster here than here. But crowds is the other way around. If every time stuck in a big crowd, probably go to the side, you may move faster. Why it happens, but they've observed that. Uh, let's look at something else like other behaviors, what we call, this is called the, the jamming. You've come from wide to narrow corridor. And around the jamming, you'll probably observe like an arching. So again, we were seeing this visual pattern. It was sort of encouraging to us that our model does seem to work well. And that's called wake effect, another one of those. Now, we also worked with some folks in Europe. They've done a lot of lab setting. They basically people lock in the lab setting, and they were making trajectories. And they say, how do two people walk in a simple lab setting? Then we'll see more complex trajectories. <laughs> and what we found was at least our least effort model seem to, at least in a very simple setting, seem to match pretty close with real trajectory. And again, there's encouraging that, OK, we seem to be capturing some sense of human behavior, walking pattern, that we can do right here. And this example, other least effort, was called experimental data. And again, we're seeing a pretty good match with the noise factor to do this. This is what I call the fundamental diagram. I don't know why they call it fundamental diagram. This is actually from traffic literature. This is nothing else but inverse relationship that the typical speed at which the agents in a crowd walk is inversely proportional to density. It's very much like traffic. When the road is free, you can drive 60 miles, 80 miles an hour. When the density gets high, you slow down. The same thing in traffic is called Weidemann's fundamental diagram. And over the centuries, people have observed measurements and lab done it. So this say we did the Weidemann original fundamental diagram, the same setting. And we got a reasonably good quadratic fit that, again, saying our model is similarly following the same pattern of speed versus density relationship. That's encouraging. Now, there's some lab setting tests people have done, a test in lab, where you basically come from a wide narrow corridor like this. You can see they come, and they come across it. So people done a lab experiment where they go and play with the width of this storm. So you can see if the width goes increases, how does the flow rate goes up? It's a total measurement. And this experiment has been done different people in different settings. Say Fred did it in 2007, somebody in 1981. At least four different data we could collect from different papers. And again, you know, different dependent setting, different human subjects they had. They got different results. So again, our was, you know, in the middle, predicted. Again, as a statical manner, you can say we're kind of following the pattern, right? They're going there. Now, that comes to the next part. This is the low level part of it. Ultimately, how do humans move? And it's amazing that I'm talking about this. I'm in Newell Salmon building, right? So the classic work of Newell, which is published in a great well-known book, which is in one of the best books I've ever read, Unified Theory of Cognition, that they have, Newell defined this notion now that a lot of human decision making goes with layers. There's a physical, reactive, cognitive, rational, social culture. Probably you folks know more about it. So what we tried to do for crowd simulation, <clears throat> we got inspired by you know, Newell's classification and do something similar in a model. So the thing I showed you so far, collision avoidance with optimization and local response is like physical layer. 
what you're doing unconsciously, the laziness part, biomechanical laziness, you try to minimize energy, is somewhat some of the reactive layer. But the other big part, some of you may be more aggressive than the other. Some of you may be more shy or introvert. Does that reflect your participation in crowd motion? And the answer is yes. And then how do you react to the situation? There are a lot of things that come up. So I will not go into too many details of that, but one thing we tried to model was how does crowd behavior change as a function of human personality? Now, how do you classify personality? That itself is a million dollar question. We are not psychologists, we don't want to invent that field, but the idea we tried to do was, here's a different classification of personalities you get from some personality model traits. Here's our model of a crowd agent based on a bunch of parameters. So we said, could we drive a mapping of a personality to these parameters? And yes, we could. How do we do it? We did a bunch of data-driven metric, which is very popular used in animation literature, and performed statistical inferencing. So I won't bore you the details of that, that how with a lot of questionnaires and this thing. And based on basically a lot of simulation parameters, we come with a classification of different kind of agents. So the real part of this, the whole exercise was that we have a notion of what we call trait theory applied to this RV of behavior. Trait theory is a well-known personality model, model from psychology. And what we found was, at least to a pleasant surprise, just two parameters were able to capture 95% of the model. That was actually a very surprising result that my student found based on this thing, that basically now we can specify different passive models. So let me show you how this works out. This is a crowd simulation like I showed you before. I'll show you what's called homogeneous crowd, where everybody's the same personality and everybody's distinct personality. Let's look at this. Next crowd simulation scenario. Of agents evacuating through a shared accident. Here we see the default behavior. So everybody's similar, same personality, same characteristics. So you see some kind of flow pattern, you see some kind of a movement. Here we see aggressive agents in red. And the aggressive guy behavior as aggressive agents try to pass slower individuals in front of them. So it's like an aggressive driver. But there are no lanes here, so. Finally, we show agents with several different personalities. Aggressive, impulsive, active, assertive, tense, and shy. So in any crowd simulation, you know, how the human personalities have come up, it affects the crowd behavior. And of course, what we're giving you the mechanism to try to model that behavior. <laughs> the other part is, there's no reason to believe human behavior remains the same. We react to each other, we react to the environment. So how can we model the dynamic behavior, especially you may become more aggressive, more impulsive with this parameter? So again, you know, one thing we try to do was, again, psychology, borrowed from psychology, how people react to external condition of threats and again, in cognitive modeling, there is something called general adaptation syndrome, or we call the gas model, proposed by actually by Sealy's in mid 50s. It's again to see how people have bought this thing and use it up. But the idea is that any environmental effect that you have, we call it a stressor. You know, same kind of a stress. We all under stress. They use the term stressor. So it's an example of, for example, you're crossing a street light and it suddenly becomes red. You start running or crowding occurs, or some threat occurs. So these are all examples of different kind of stressors that do it. So the gas model is very interesting. It's purely empirical. They look at data, and this is like a curve. It's not it's a function given by differential equation. The idea is that when people are exposed to stress, they go through three stages. They build up a response, which is alarm. Then the whole response, hope and threat will remove. But if it get really bad, exhaustion, and the death occurs. This is a psychological term of death. Now. This is purely empirical data we got. So we try to approximate it, this thing. We have a model like this. As opposed to that exact function, we model like a slope like this, have the stress, and then normal resolution. So this is the kind of your model stress in the behavior and why I'm taking into account. And again, there's a term in psychology which is saying, it's something we're doing in life. You know, some amount of stress is useful. It makes us better people. But too much of stress destroys you. It's the same kind of characteristic 
a little bit of aggressiveness is nice, but don't be everybody over aggressive, what they always advise you. So here's an example of, you know, Yerkes Dodson law, different examples of the lane formation I showed you example. In the last case, we see a different example of modeling. So different level of stress occurs, and you will see, you know, less stress, the Yerkin Dodson laws, and stress occurs. So different if people are different kind of stress, how would their behavior happen in the lane? And I don't know if people at the back, you have to really pay attention to that, how they're going here, highly stressed. This is where resistance occurs, this is the initial alarm stage. And you see different kind of crowd behaviors. So this is an example of how you're reacting to each other and to the environment goes on. Uh, okay, and so this is just a very high level view. If you have more questions, we can talk more about offline. Now let me take you some applications. Taking all these ideas from geometric optimization, biomechanics, psychology, sociology, are they be applied to application? And the idea is, hopefully, yes, I'll convince you, like architecture analysis, like I told you about the example of Hudge. I showed results from multi-robot navigation. And believe it or not, uh, the gamers seem to be loving this stuff. A lot of gamers are implementing this in game engine, and I'll show you some example of that. In case you want to try this idea, <clears throat> the basic RVO library is available as our lab website. You can download it. Uh, many game vendors license it, and many other game vendors just implemented it. It's available as part of Unity Engine. I've done part of that. UDK is doing that, and you can get different codes out right out there. So as I told you, we have big collaboration with Hajj Research Institute. This is an example of a very particular ritual they do during the Hajj and also during the rest of the time Umrah. There's a holy black stone, <coughs> and again, my knowledge is limited. They go and take seven circles. Around the seven circles, they stop and pray, and idly speaking, they will love and go and kiss the black stone. This is what every pilgrim, it's my simplification of what I'm trying to say. Hopefully, Yasser, I'm, I'm OK, right? I'm not deviating too much from the, from the ground truth. Uh, so this is only one part of the mataf, the upper level. And the estimate is that at the peak capacity, this mataf can estimate anywhere from 35 to 40,000 people. You know, you can't count. You go to this number, you can only estimate. It's like when they were having the Arab Spring, how many people are there at Tahir Square? They're saying million people. If it's 100 people, the government won't take you seriously. But million people, OK, it's a serious. So how big is the crowd? These are all statistical estimates. They're just very hard to do real number counting here. But this is an example of crowd dynamics. So they have been actually looking at crowd flow. And there was a Jamaat Bridge, unfortunate disaster. They improved that. So these people have been applying crowd simulation ideas to do better architecture flow for, for, for a good reason. So this is an example of, you might say, well, you know what? From a distance, they all look the same. Why so hard? But this is actually a very heterogeneous crowd simulation. We may not visually see it. Because at any time, some pilgrims are doing circle. They could be circle number three, circle number four. A few of them, what we call, are cutting towards the, the Kaaba. Some of them call it a snake motion. They come on the floor. Few of them are exiting. You've got young people. You've got older people. You've got people on wheelchairs. It's a very challenging flow. And if you're more interested in that, I can show you a video of that. So this is an example on the top right. I will show you the video. Now, you can't build it, spend so much money, and, and bottleneck comes up. This is a classic example of if you have a better crowd simulator, a real crowd simulator, you can make a big difference here. This is another example of other behaviors that we see in real world you can simulate here. So this is what we call, in real world, social priority behavior. Agents use the priority proxy to efficiently disembark while the boarding agents in turn wait and then board. So this is like protocol. People get out first, then they get in. So it's kind of asymmetric behavior we see in real life. And again, we can do that. Since we had a very real-time crowd simulation system, you know, one thing my system did, people did was a big multi-touch table before multi-touch play became really popular. And you know, you're doing this flow. What if I have this flow? What if I take these people and drive them here? Or what if I take those people, drive them here? What if I do the flow? So so-called if-then analysis tool. You have a reasonably accurate simulator. You change the design. How does it affect the design? So this is kind of a collaborative planner with some architects think will be a very useful tool. But the other part was, can we go to robots? Now, it's always fun to talk about humans and robots. Humans are irrational, hard to model. What about robots? Well, robots, depending on what robot you have, and I'm giving this talk at robotics, <laughs> you're the best robotic toys in the world. You know, there are a lot of constraints. In my previous work, I assume it's all synthetic. All my position velocity is well known. Well, sorry, it doesn't happen that way in robotics, right? Your sensors are, you only have get partial position, some uncertainty. Your motion uncertainty, that people in robotics dealing for 20 years with uncertainty problem do it. And then your dynamics constraints. I always say, human can go circle like this. 
Could a robot do that? Could your car do that? So we have different dynamic constraints. So you have to do a motion which deal with all the uncertainty and all the searching. So one of my students just defended it's Jamie Snap, and he had published a whole bunch of paper report. Let me just show you some results, what we call notion of hybrid reciprocal velocity obstacle, which can take into account this modeling of this noise. And uh, <coughs> so we just took a bunch of room bars. I don't have the best toys that you guys have. And we want some bunch of cheap room bars. But they're just automatically navigating and avoiding collision and keeping the path to be smooth. But we take into account all uncertainty and still can give some guarantee on the smooth of the motion. Here's an example of four such robots going together. So each robot motion was done in a purely decentralized manner, taking into account all the sensing there. Now we have put this stuff together. Some of my friends at Willow Garage, you know, they had a better robot, like this PR2, and they put the carts. So they have a more fancy demo of the same kind of system. With the different dynamic constraints here than the robot, and how they avoid collision and move with each other. So at least try to show we can combine with robotic constraints and do realistic stuff. As I mentioned before, actually, the one of the places this has taken off is actually gaming. There was this game called Warhammer 40,000. Anybody played with this game? Well, you guys don't play games here. OK, this is a popular game of 2011. They actually took our stuff. And I don't want to show videos of that. They're a copyright issue. But all these, unfortunately, all these games are very violent. So, so let's not do that. But, these gamers use our stuff and in integrated that. And actually, the best, I think, compliment we ever got was in the, in the press, in Daily Telegraph, because they did not use too many agents. They think crowds were too slow. But since our stuff was so fast, this is what the media said, no matter how many oaks are barreling your way, and there'll be a lot, the frame rate never took a hit. So this was their way of saying it's not a bad speed stuff. And, but they, all these, these oaks come together, and you know how they bump or avoid collision behavior? Orca was one of our optimization scheme they use inside this. And just to show it's not just there, you know, my own student built a game, you know, in like Unity 3D. I was talking to Max, who teaches Unity 3D at, at CMU. So you can take like a game on your handheld device. It's a pretty pathetic graphics, but you got a dog and a sheep, and you can make this. You know, see all sheep are very close to each other, very dense, and how dog is basically steering all the sheep away, you know, or something like that. So again, this is just for fun. I have the same game on my iPhone on my laptop too. But you know, this is the search. So where do we go from here? You know, this is, as I said, we integrate this with iOS game. This is the call we call Herdem. It's available for iOS, Android, PC, web browser. You can go and play with it. But it's pretty, pretty crummy graphics, because my students are doing research in crowd simulation. They say we're not working on graphics. So that's what it is. Where do we go from here? Now, this is what I've told you in the last 45, 50 minutes. It's just the first attempt. There are just so many challenges that can probably go on for another hour and tell about what all the things we cannot do. You know, so the question that comes and asks me, people in Hajj always ask me, hey, this is the great grand mosque, and they're doing amazing amount of expansion. So they come and ask me the question. Even some big architect firm from Germany contacted me, hey, we saw your web page. We have this new design. Uh, could you run the crowd simulation on this and tell us where the flow will be right? And I'm very worried to tell them I have no clue, really. Because it's very hard for me to validate my crowd flow at that scale. I'm hoping my computer vision friends can someday track these dense crowds, you know, like, like Yasser is doing with his basketball dome and hoping to reject it. At, at this density, they can do the tracking of the crowd. And maybe my motion model can help with the tracking so we can do some validation. I'm just getting some GPS data in this thing. Now, you say, of course, the dead density of the position be accurate. It's not the position that counts. It's the velocity. Luckily, they're getting velocity like that. But how do, we, how do we design a crowd simulation system which can capture the human trait? And what happens when you're doing a Hajj in November with a lot of older people, or Hajj will come in summer, in June, when it's 50 degrees Celsius, 120 degrees Fahrenheit, what will happen? So it's not a single group of people. Humans are dynamic personalities. And how can you affect the flow? So this is one of those big challenges that comes up. And this doesn't come up here. It's surprising that they say, we all go to the hotel. We all go to the building. Like, how many emergency exits this building has? Does anybody know the answer? On the third floor, how many emergency exits do you have? Do you know? Two, three, four, five? Do you know how they do it? So this, I've heard the civil engine architects have the rules of thumb. This building is designed for maybe 350 people, OK? 
four exits like flooring, they have some basic rule of thumb and they'll put five or six exits like that. It's purely based on rule of thumb. There's not, and then someday they might do a drill, like an officer do a drill and figure out, could you do 90 second evacuation before you got this building, like the Boeing has to do or Airbus has to do. But literally these folks in engineering have been doing this kind of pedestrian dynamics or stadium designs, but they don't have very accurate tools. Rather, most of the time they do very conservative estimates and just good rule of thumb. Let's say one exit for every 200 people or one exit for every 500 people depending on the setting. That's all they do. But this is a real challenge about, are we doing something like this? Now this is an example of where a very high crowd comes, those five days in a year, where it really matters to them. They want to increase the flow, but how do we do it? And I don't think the current simulation technology is good enough to answer that question. There's still too many challenges to really achieve that goal, and this is going on. Uh, the other issue about how do we compare accuracy, even, even if I give you crowd, even if I give you some tracking data, how do I say this simulation, now, like I showed you Shibuya, okay? I showed the real versus virtual. I say in computer graphics, I always, people cheat, right? It looks okay, because it's plausible simulation, because visual eye looks okay. That's okay for graphics, good for game, good for animation. Is it good for architecture analysis? So just recently, about a few months ago, you know, we published a new work based on idea from statistical entropy metric, you know? That if you're given some simulation, some data, how do we make sure the metric can matter? Like a global entropy measure, but it is not sensitive to noise. How do you even validate them? The issues are there. And one of the great projects that actually I want to, this, this is comes I want to do, I talked to a bunch of people here today, <laughs> You know, like we have cameras everywhere. We all know cameras are cheap. Like, I don't know, in London I've heard there are more cameras than people. Or, or some, every street has so many cameras. The cameras can look at people. One thing they want to know, could you predict, let's say right now it's 4.30, in 15 minutes from now there's going to be a crowd trouble. See, if there's a crowd, some disaster occurs, some crowd, bad crowd occurs, you call the police, by the time police come, it's too late. So this is an example of simulation plus prediction. Could you take the camera, look at the state of the crowd with all the great tracking work, run your forward simulation and predict the state of the crowd. And I've seen this in multiple conversation with many of you this morning. We need real-time simulation, real-time tracking and close the whole loop and do the whole simulation sensing together just with a better prediction. And this really happens because if you look at, you know, a few years ago, this happened in Germany, you know, the Love Festival, right? You know, there was a big million people, unfortunately many people died. Just a couple of weeks ago, there was a big disaster in Brazil. There was some partying and teenagers, some fire occurred, closing occurred, and, why, and most people actually died because of, you know, suffocation, or they get trapped, because they were, the evacuation was not done. So there are all these issues about, if you can do simulation, what we ultimately want to do is integrating sensing, detecting, and predicting. This is the thing which I think is the most exciting work. There's a lot of people sensing work in vision, a lot of people working on simulation in robotics and graphic and crowd simulation. Can we do a real-time loop and predict that? And the best analogy I give you is exactly, look at the weather prediction. The weather prediction going on, how much snow is Boston going to get tonight, right? You have a big supercomputer running with all kind of simulation. You've got all kind of atmospheric sensing data in the air and updating the weather prediction. The front going to hit here, like, am I going to catch my flight tonight? I don't know, depending on this thing. So similar kind of a loop, we do that. There are a lot of exciting stuff coming on there. So that's pretty much it. So I want to thank all my collaborators who have given me a lot of exciting data, the folks at Hudge Research Institute, and the folks at uh, Ulysses Computing Center who did all the stadium data, Intel, uh, Relic, the gamers, and the Willow Garage. And last but not the least, let me also thank all the people who paid the bills. So thank you very much for your time. I'll be glad to answer any questions you have. Yes. So uh, some of the exam models that you're using are sort of bottom up, right? So you're doing individual people and you're getting aggregate behaviors bottom up. Yeah. So there must be a centralized or top down or maybe a combination of the two for big crowds, right? So you might have, you know, public announcements that are directing people. Right. Uh, so that's more top down. That's that's also dynamic. It's not pre code. So what, what do you think about how, you know, how to combine these things? So if you're given, uh, so in most of our case, you know, we have assumed that every human is individual making his or her decision. That's what we have done. Now, uh, let me answer your question in two parts. Even when you look at mostly real world crowds, uh, 
folks have observed that any real world setting, let's say you go to watch a basketball game, or you want to go to a mall, or if you go to airport, in any crowd, uh, most humans are not alone. 60 70% of people are part of some groups. And so they have some kind of a group dynamic behavior there. That's just an example of something I did not talk about. And then what you're saying is, let's say you're at the airport or some big thing, an announcement comes, everybody goes to exit C. So right now we don't do that, but I don't think it'll be very hard to do that. So what, to me, there's a high level specification. I have a very individual model. And if every one of this room is say, go to that exit, okay? All I have to do is change my goal to do that. So I mean, you can think of not just, that would be the highest level. Right, right. and you can win between. That, that would be for yeah. everybody. Right. So then if you say, I want to do, as you said, group voice, so think hierarchical at different scales. Will that help somehow? You can say, you know, this region, people in this area between this pillar and that pillar has to go here, and this have to go there. So there might be a continuum of. <laughs> sure, sure. So, so we have, you're right, so what we are defining is, you know, we are like a four layer model. So of course we don't have a content because we, in each layer we are taking ideas from optimization, biomechanics, psychology, and sociology will do that. So I would say it would be great to have, you know, somewhere coming in the middle and do something like that. It will be nice, you know, but the time being, we just assume given high level specification comes and it goes on the pyramid and we do individual level. The reason I mention group is because if every agent is independent of avoiding each other in group, you know, it's like you're moving together. And I was talking to Yasser about, you know, some basketball. So right now I'm assuming that all humans are good cooperative humans. Like, I want to work collision with you, you want to work collision with me. But if you're playing basketball, I want to collide with you and stop you. So those are all examples of, you know, kind of what I call, I call abnormal behavior in some way, or atypical behavior. So all this is typically, all this some we have done is assuming a generic typical behavior and how we go from that. But uh, uh, can we do something in the middle? That'll be, that'll be a good question. I guess what, one thing is, is intelligence hurting us? If oh, people are all completely dumb, yep. would they be able to do better? Because you know, the guys are thinking for themselves and doing random things. So that's, is that hurting us? You know, I, I don't have a real answer, I just give a guess, you know? The only guess I have is that most of the crowd, and this is what we're trying to do, most morally interactions happen at the microscopic level. <coughs> so even when you see a big crowd, the Hajj, or the, the Shibuya, or the airport, you know, you are just looking at people around you and doing it. It's only somebody with a big camera can look at it. Most humans don't have that big view. So it's most of the microscopic interaction we give to microscopic behavior. That's what we observe. I really don't know the, the real part. How much intelligence is helping us, hurting us? How do you quantify that? I don't have a good answer to that. Yeah? So I didn't get a good feel for this uh, velocity algorithm, but does it do full-blown path planning? In other words, if it heads into a dead end, it can back up and go somewhere else? So this is a great example. If people in motion planning, like, and in fact, I come from that school of thought, complete motion planning, right? This is an example of what we call a decentralized motion planning problem, distributed. <clears throat> so uh, strictly speaking, you know, any decentralized planner, there could be a path, collision-free path for all the agents, but it's not going to find. It's a decentralized planner. I was worried about completeness. Right, but Let, let's just reduce it to one person in the department. So, okay, one person department store, so one single person, and you're this thing. So what we have done here is, you're right, we have a notion of what we call global navigation, which is like a road map, right. and local collision avoidance. And the good analogy I give you is like when you drive, if you Google direction, Google direction like a global navigation. But when you're steering, you're avoiding local collision. It's exactly that model. So global so, navigation comes from somewhere. So else. global navigation, so the velocity obstacle is equal to the local collision avoidance. But I assume that every agent has like a spatial map in their mind. But there, there is a local behavior they can't do, which is they sort of turn backwards and retreat. Is that right? Uh, I won't say they cannot do, but because he, all they're doing is, if you look at the example, actually the circle's moving, right? The red circle was going up towards the goal, straight line. But when people came around, it went around it. It, it had this goal position it wanted to go, it took the velocity which is closest to this velocity and try to avoid it. 
So I could potentially think of a situation, you can create a circle that it go like this, it go like this, it could, it could go like this. It could happen, could not happen. But really what you're saying is, what I'm doing is that each incident I'm doing a local behavior. And yeah, I'm trying to figure out the relationship with potential function algorithm. So potential function, of course, is a well-known term. In fact, social force is like potential function. The potential function known for the fact you define a global potential field, but there the classic problem will get stuck in local minima. That was the potential classic potential function was like. So is there a simple answer to the question, how does converting the velocity space avoid the local minima? Uh, I, uh, to know, I don't think we can avoid the local minima, uh, that part there. The thing between potential, the potential function is a little bit more like the forces function I showed right. it to you. That's right. And what happens is most, when people didn't bother with potential function, they were like, as you said, single robot in a grocery store, they're good for it. In my case, when I showed like the, the Hudge, you got people with such a high density. And when your potential function, so you got like, imagine my goal is there, that's my attractive potential, but everybody around me, this huge number of people repulsing. And that makes the stable system very unstable. That's why I was referring to social force and potential, because potential function has not been applied in a very dense setting. We're, we're kind of repulsing from all the nearby agents. So that's where the velocity space reasoning is not prone to those instability problems. That's all I can promise you. I, I apologize for monopolizing the thing. But just one last question. Is that a numerical conditioning problem with the force approach, or is it something more fundamental? I think it's a well-known fact, you know, basically if you've got a lot of forces acting, it's, what, you will, what you'll have to do is, in your simulation, you'll have to make your time step really, really, really small. So it's kind of a numerical problem. And like the Hudge, it'll be such as to get a stable simulation, you have to make your simulation, like in people, if you do physically based modeling, you know, we talk about explicit and implicit methods. Right. Implicit methods are more expensive, but you can take bigger time steps. Explicit methods are cheaper, but you take smaller time steps. So you could do potentially do forces based and potential force example of that, right. but you have to the system to make sure the stable system, the simulation is stable, you take extremely small time step and that'll slow down the whole simulation. But the velocity method because of optimization don't have the numerical problem. That's the best guarantee I can give you. But it can I cannot prove it to you, it will not get stuck in local minima. Yeah, no, 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 and I cannot even do that. Because the local method, any local method can get stuck in local minima, that problem remains. And if you're in a James Bond movie or even a Die Hard movie, there's an evil criminal who'll drop balls and sure. shoot you all out. But in so remember, I said, in my simulation, I think all humans are good. Okay? <laughs> he wants to be the basketball player, right? He loves Michael Jordan. He wants to block me, right? The basketball scene we were just talking about, not just you in person. But I'm I saying. Think hockey is, should really be your example. Who? Hockey. Okay, That's well, where hitting people is fundamental. All right. No, we were just having talk about basketball. He showed me stuff. And basketball we players are wimps. <laughs> <laughs> I also knew how this became about me, but apparently. <laughs> well, he had a basketball dome. You were showing me his data. So, and his, his some of the research, very impressive stuff I saw basketball. But yeah, you're right. Soccer, football. But those are adversaries. So, I'm definitely not modeling that. I, I call that abnormal behavior. I'm assuming we're all good, cooperative, good human beings. Who wants to help each other? Yeah. So, in the context of driving and traffic slowdowns, traffic jams, can you comment on, say, an optimal driving personality uh, to avoid that? Because there's a whole lot of game theory that goes into, into driving. You know, uh, you pick a strategy that is, is good for you, right. merging in the last minute, or good for the everybody else on the road. So, if I understand your question correctly, you know, as I said, right now I have a forward simulation system where if you give me 20 agents, and you have somebody to characterize the personality of that, I can give you the simulation. That's what I'm doing. And if I understand you correctly, you're saying, if I had the choice of picking personalities, what personalities will I pick so that some simulation parameters are my simulation optimized? Is that the question? Like some uh, flow or right, some, or, some... You know, who, who are the prevalent people on the road that are causing all the, the traffic jams? Or, yeah, well, uh, traffic, actually we are doing some work on traffic. Traffic is, a, in fact, I think traffic is an easier problem than this one because traffic is, my gut, because you're driving in lanes and your car has constraints, you can't do this motion. Like, what you were asking, 180 degrees like this. I think traffic, my feeling of traffic is easier. But, uh, but even in this case, I told you the architecture flow problem and Hudge is the same problem. They're asking me to say, how can I redesign the Mataf so I get the maximum flow? That's the question they have. And honestly speaking, I don't have a good answer for them. All I can do is, you give me a layout, I'll try my simulator, if my simulator is doubly accurate, I can do some flow analysis. Now you could potentially say, well, if I have an optimization framework, you know, 
And if I can take the parameters of my architecture layout as some kind of a parameters, I can define optimization function and then numerically figure it out. So I could potentially do something like that. But the point is, my crowd simulation is a discrete event simulation system. So, and if I do a continuous flow at a high level discrete event simulation system, I will it be a good answer? I've not tried it, so I, I don't know about that. It's a, something worth trying. But that's what they really want to know. How do you optimize the crowd flow? How do you design the architecture to optimize the crowd flow? And we don't have a good answer to that right now. Right, but there was a question earlier, and you said maybe we can simulate groups. Is there a multi-level or multi-resolution approach to this problem, which goes between continuums and particles and groups of particles? So, what not? So this approach that I've talked about called multi-agent, where every agent is this thing. There have been some work done. In fact, uh, I know one of the fact, Adrian Troy did some very work on this but when he was at UW, Continuum Crowd. And there's also work done at UNC. There are a lot of people say at a very high density, density more than four and five, crowd becomes a continuum. And they model like a fluid simulation. So there's a friends of mine at UNC, they've done a bunch of papers on continuum. And there's a continuum simulation, there's a discrete, this is more discrete simulation, and they have a looking into kind of, you know, have a hybrid simulation system where a low density is discrete as a high density continuum. So one of my colleagues, Ming Lin, and she had a paper at SIGGRAPH two years ago, we actually did that for traffic. They had a hybrid simulation system on traffic, they published in SIGGRAPH, I think about two years ago, where they showed continuum versus this. We could potentially do it here also, you know. But that, but even if a continuum thing, see the continuum fluid is about the flow. What we are looking into is modeling the environment in some kind of unknown variable. And how would the flow change with that environment, optimal flow with that environment? So that parameter is external to the environment. How do you model that with this? Uh, that is a, still a good question there. You know, as I told you, there's a lot of room for research. And I hope I can excite you people to come and work with us. But these are all fantastic questions. And I wish I had good answers for you. More questions? Unless no one has any more, but thank you. Thanks again for staying so long.